Hello, my name is James Robson, and I'm the Victor and William Fung Director of the Harvard Asia Center. And I wanted to welcome everyone to this discussion of the recent elections in Myanmar, which is part of the Asia Beyond the Headlines series at the Harvard University Asia Center. This series will be included among the Asia Center's virtual programs uh, posted on our website. So I'm very happy to be joined today by four speakers who will all be giving their impressions of the recent elections in Myanmar. The first speaker will be the Honorable Thomas Andrews, who is the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Situation of Human Rights in Myanmar and has been appointed the Robina Senior Human Rights Fellow at the Shell Center for International Human Rights at Yale University, where he'll be working to develop human rights advocacy strategies and engage students at Yale Law School on issues related to human rights crisis in, in Myanmar. And he's also been recently appointed as an associate at the Harvard Asia Center. Prior to his work at the UN, uh, Tom Andrews served uh, in the United States Congress representing the state of Maine, and he's also run a number of national advocacy organizations in, in his career before the UN. The second speaker will be Andrea Gittleman, who is the program manager at the Simon Scott Center for the Prevention of Genocide at the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum, where she focuses on policy outreach, justice and accountability efforts for mass atrocities and leads the center's work on Myanmar. Previously, she was the interim director of U.S. policy and senior legislative counsel at Physicians for Human Rights, where she designed advocacy and policy strategies on a broad range of international human rights issues, including mass atrocities. The third speaker will be Weiwei Nu. Weiwei is the founder and executive director of the Women's Peace Network and the founder of the Yangon Youth Leadership Center. After seven years as a political prisoner in Burma, Weiwei emerged as a prominent voice fighting for equal rights and democracy. In 2013, she founded the Women's Peace Network, and since then she has tirelessly fought against the political oppression, violence, and genocide that has plagued women, youth, and marginalized communities, especially those from the Rakhine State. Weiwei received her bachelor's degree in law from the University of Yangon in Myanmar and her master's degree in law from the University of Berkeley. And her continued uh, peace building efforts have earned her a number of national and international uh, forms of recognition. Weiwei has been named to the BBC's uh, list of top 100 women in 2014 and featured in international media and invited to the White House and Congress for different forms of addresses. Finally, Matthew Smith is the co-founder and chief executive officer of Fortify Rights, a human rights organization based in Southeast Asia that supports human rights uh, defenders and litigates human rights violations, combining two commonly separate areas of the human rights movement. Fortify Rights was the 2018 recipient of the Roger E. Joseph Prize for its extraordinary work to protect survivors of mass atrocities, crimes, and hold per perpetrators accountable in Myanmar. Matthew was a 2014 Echoing Green Global Fellow and previously worked with uh, Human Rights Watch, Earth Rights International, and he is also currently a fellow of the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy uh, at Harvard University. So first of all, welcome uh, to you all and thank you for, for joining us in this conversation. And so what I'd like to do is to begin by having each of you give some of your general thoughts and impressions on the overall outcome of the recent uh, elections that happened on November 8th in Myanmar. Uh, and then we'll uh, expand the discussion from that. But I'd like to begin with Tom Andrews. Well, thank you, James, very, very much. And uh, thank you to the Asia Center and Harvard for, uh, for hosting this forum. And it's a, a real pleasure uh, to be on this panel with uh, uh, so many distinguished uh, panelists and friends who are just very, very knowledgeable about this. So I'm going to try to highlight some of the observations that I've had, um, uh, both as special rapporteur observing closely uh, the election, but also as someone who's run in several elections here in the United States, um, and then uh, pass it on to my, uh, to my colleagues on the panel. Uh, first of all, um, for those of us in the United States, who were also following uh, the situation in Myanmar very closely, um, only five days separated um, the U.S. election and the Myanmar election. Um, and while there were a lot of differences, significant difference between the two, there were some similarities. And, and one of the similarities that uh, emerged is the, uh, the difficulty uh, that some have in accepting defeat uh, in an election. Uh, the uh, USDP, uh, the Union uh, Solidarity and Development Party, which was established by the, uh, the military in Myanmar, uh, just were roundly defeated across the country. They did uh, quite poorly 
even in, in, even by those who thought that they would be do much better in certain areas, they did quite poorly. Uh, but they are calling for a, a complete new set of elections. Uh, they said that the voting irregularities required that there be new elections and that the military supervise the next set of a, set of elections. And then over here on this side of the planet, um, as we know here, the Trump administration uh, lost and the president and his campaign continues to uh, attack uh, the election thing was unfair uh, and, uh, and, is, and is calling for um, the courts to overturn uh, the, the election. So there's unfortunately uh, similarities in those, in those two, two respects. Um, but let me tell you first, as, as Special Repertoire was very um, uh, pleased when the permanent representative of Myanmar to the Human Rights Council in Geneva, uh, Cha Mo Tun said that, that the standard that he had and that Myanmar had for these elections were the following, that they be free, they be fair, they be credible, they be transparent, and that the results reflect the will of the people. And I think that's, that's tremendous. I agree with, them, uh, with him com completely. Um, but it is impossible, uh, as I told the Human Rights Council, uh, for an election to be free and fair uh, and for the results to reflect the will of the people if the right to vote is based on one's race, one's ethnicity, and one's religion. And as we know, uh, those in the Rohingya community, as Wei Wei will uh, explain to us, um, had absolutely no ability or capacity uh, to vote uh, precisely because uh, they are Rohingya. Now, I've, I've been observing some of the statements that have been made by delegations to the United Nations in reaction and response to the election in Myanmar. Um, uh, some have said that this is a, uh, a very important step forward. Uh, this marks a progress for uh, democracy in Myanmar, an historic milestone, as, as someone put it. Um, but when it comes to the fundamental right to vote, this can also be considered to be a step backward with this denial of enfranchisement for the, for the Rohingya community. Because back in 2010, uh, the Rohingya community had the right to vote, but that is no longer present in 2020. So that, that is clearly, in my view, uh, a, step, a step backward. Uh, in addition to that, there were several townships uh, that were denied the right to vote in Myanmar because they, they were in conflict areas. And, and what was, what was um, uh, unfortunate about this is that it, there was no uh, a, apparent attempt in, that I could see of the, the Union Election Commission finding alternative ways for people in those districts to vote. And there was no criteria uh, on, on establishing where uh, a certain area, a district, would not be allowed to vote because of, of volatility and the potential of voting. And then the whole process was con conducted without any transparency whatsoever, leading to some uh, to argue that the decisions to, to not have elections in certain uh, districts had more to do with politics than it had to do with, uh, with security. So that was a, uh, that was a real uh, problem. Now, the lifeblood of any democracy, of course, uh, is freedom of expression, freedom of association, freedom of the press. And as my colleagues can, and I'm sure will describe you, there was very important shortcomings in all three of those areas. But as someone who used to run for public office and used to run grassroots campaigns in my candidacy, uh, I was particularly interested in uh, the fact that under COVID-19, under these conditions, uh, it was extremely difficult, if not impossible, particularly for new candidates and parties to make themselves known to the, to the population of, of, of Myanmar, to their co potential constituents. And so they relied more than ever on the media to get their messages across. And candidates had access to state media uh, in which they could uh, write a message and deliver that message that would be then uh, shown to constituencies all over, all over Myanmar. Now, the problem with that was, was that in order for you to get to, to be allowed to uh, have a message delivered on state media, um, you had to have that message approved by state media. So in other words, even if you were criticizing the government uh, as part of your campaign message, uh, you had to overcome government censors of that very message. And I was informed by political parties and the candidates that some of their messages, they could not deliver them because they were, they were critical. Some were critical of, of uh, uh, the treatment of children, for example, I was told. Others uh, quoting uh, uh, UNICEF from, from the UN. So the, again, the criteria was, was vague. Uh, 
uh, criteria including uh, the, the message disrespects existing laws or tarnishes the image of the nation or defames the Tatmadaw. These were some of the criteria that were used in deciding whether a candidate's message would be allowed on the airwaves or not. And of course, there were many, many problems that occurred as a result of that. So that was very, very unfortunate. And it meant that uh, there were candidates and parties who were not allowed under the conditions of COVID-19 to uh, get their message across. Two other points I'd, I'd like to make uh, finally. Uh, and, and, and one is, is that while there was some incremental progress in uh, the number of women who were uh, candidates and were involved in the political process, it was a very, very small number. Uh, only 16% uh, of the candidates running in uh, Myanmar, Myanmar's election uh, were, uh, were women. And, 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 and finally, despite uh, a provision of a law that called for uh, the right of disabled uh, people in Myanmar uh, to, to have the right to vote, uh, more than two thirds of the polling stations in uh, in, in Myanmar were, were inaccessible uh, to people with uh, mobility disabilities. Uh, and there were apparently uh, few provisions that were made uh, for those uh, citizens to, uh, to cast their, their votes. So those are my um, a few insights and, and highlights of, uh, of, of an election, both from my perspective as a, someone who's run for office and as the uh, UN Special Rapporteur on the situation of human rights uh, in Myanmar. Great, thank you very much, Tom. So why don't we turn to Andrea now? Sure, thank you. Um, so first off, thank you for inviting me to join you today. And it's an honor to be here with my fellow panelists. Uh, so briefly, when we think about the elections in Myanmar or Burma, um, and we think about the, the lens that the, the Holocaust Museum uses, so looking at the lens of um, ongoing atrocity risk and what the future of mass atrocities could look like in the country, I'm aware that that's a narrow sliver, um, a kind of a, a focused lens with which to understand the elections. And when we think of the, the Holocaust Museum and the, in particular our Center for the Prevention of Genocide, the Simon Scott Center, um, when we think about risks around elections, oftentimes people think about risks on election day. So violent voter suppression or ways to um, kind of um, intimidate you know, one political party supporter or, or another. And I think what we're seeing here in Burma is we're not exactly um, concerned about that kind of very short term immediate uh, atrocity risk around the elections. And I think the elections as they you know, took place earlier this month have shown that there were not widespread um, instances of, of physical violence um, around the election. And while that is positive, I think it's not really the focus or the questions that, that we should be asking. For us, one of the, the key questions we should ask around this election is how it might impact the atrocity risk in the future. So thinking in particular about the Rohingya community and the approximately 600,000 uh, who remain in Burma, in Myanmar today, and what it means for the potential recurrence of genocide and other mass atrocities. Um, and when we think about what was mentioned before about the disenfranchisement of the Rohingya, uh, that's not a, a blip on the, the road to democracy. That is the purposeful disenfranchisement, the erasure of an entire community on the basis of their identity. Um, keeping uh, Rohingya from voting, keeping Rohingya candidates from properly contesting seats, uh, those are not just accidental. Those are purposeful efforts to, again, further erode and destroy the Rohingya community in Myanmar, in Burma today. Um, and I think for for our concerns in particular, when we think about atrocity risk, uh, in disenfranchisement and restrictions on participation in public affairs can be risk factors for future genocide. So I think when we understand the factors in that light, there's actually much to be concerned about when we think about mass atrocity risk following this election. A related question I think would be to look at how the world responds and how people within Myanmar respond to the disenfranchisement of Rohingya, to um, restrictions on candidacy. This could become a new normal. In, in 2015, as was mentioned, you know, Rohingya were often you know, um, kept from voting. And what has happened between 2015 and now, I mean, we've had um, a, a genocide against the Rohingya people and the forced expulsion of, of most of the community from the country. Um, how will the world respond to the election now? Will the disenfranchisement be 
one small um, uh, you know, hiccup in an otherwise successful democracy? Or will people see this as the unacceptable step in a genocidal process that, that it is? Um, some other questions that I think we could be asking is um, whether uh, the world support for democracy promotion in Myanmar, which of course is a laudable goal, whether that will take priority over protecting the, um, the safety and the rights of all people in the country. Will atrocity prevention become subordinate um, to this, this broader goal of having um, uh, you know, uh, elections and, and having um, successful voting move forward? I think if that's the case, we'll see um, an entrenchment of the, the risks that the Rohingya community and that other vulnerable groups are going to be facing in the country. I think another question to think about is whether the world will turn away now, now that the elections are over. I think what we see in a number of contexts is there might be increased attention and perhaps a, um, a, a kind of attuning in to vulnerable communities and the risk that they face and the potential for violence in the immediate lead up to an election and during the election itself. And if an election happens and it's relatively peaceful, then the world moves on to, to other issues. And I think that would be a great disservice to vulnerable communities within Burma today, um, especially the Rohingya. I think it would be important for us to kind of redouble our efforts to look at atrocity risk and to see the election as, um, and the responses to the election either as exacerbating or potentially mitigating the risks that exist today. In order to really mitigate those risks, um, you know, atrocity prevention is not organic. It doesn't, you know, vulnerable communities are not protected automatically. I think there would need to be serious efforts by the NLD in this case, and really by the international community to press the NLD to take these issues seriously. And without a redoubling of those efforts, I would be very concerned about the, the future risks that the Rohingya community and others uh, would face in the country. And I'll, I'll leave it there, happy to expand later. Great, wonderful, thank you. Andrea. There's, I'm sure there'll be a lot of uh, uh, parts of that that we can unpack a little bit later in our discussion too. And now we'll turn to Weiwei. Thank you for including me in this um, important panel. And it's a, an honor to be with all of you guys, all of you distinguished and honorable speakers. Uh, I'm going to be focused on a little bit around the uh, attitude and the political, uh, I guess, behavior and mentality of our leaders in Myanmar and beyond. Um, I think, uh, you know, when we talk about Rohingya disenfranchisement, uh, it's not a new thing and it has been well known. Uh, by both domestically by the leaders as well as uh, internationally. And um, based on our observations, we can see, we, we, we've seen very little or almost no attempt or effort by the international community to um, restore this right or to stop disenfranchisement. Uh, instead, the Western country seems uh, they actually won NLD, won the election. Uh, I think that was somehow our understanding. Uh, with that, they supported NLD without any condition, without putting any conditions, in particular, to stop this, to end this disenfranchisement. I think that is very disturbing and very irresponsible, and that enable you know what we can oh, we we can call as the risks of the atrocity crimes in the future and continuations of genocidal uh, uh, act, as Andrea has mentioned. And I think that is the most prominent factor in all of this period from 2015 to 2020. Um, and I hope the world stop making this mistake uh, to protect people. And, um, you know, as I said, as I have been saying always, we cannot achieve democracy uh, when genocide is happening. We cannot, um, you know, we cannot actually promote democracy with the bones and blood of Rohingya. You know, we had that experience in 2017 during this democratization period, right? In 2017, when NLD party, the Aung San Suu Kyi led party is in power. And, and I think the world should stop making uh, the mistake. And going back to, uh, to, to the country, to, to Myanmar, 
I think this time exclusions of Rohingya and uh, the cancellations of elections in ethnic areas um, and all of those were actually very calculated attempt and very purposeful, very intentional, uh, as Andrea and Tom has been saying. And uh, I, I would say very calculated because uh, when it's come to the cancellations of elections in the ethnic areas, we can see all of those areas are the area, the constituencies that L the NLD party uh, has um, a potential, I mean, does not have potential to win. Um, so that is very obvious for the ethnic communities. And I think uh, that increase uh, divisions within the uh, divisions and this uh, grievances among the ethnic uh, communities against the this Burman dominated uh, political uh, machine. Uh, and when it's come to the Rohingya, again, it's very intentional. It's very purposeful. It's um, it's 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 calculated in a way that they did not receive uh, enough pressure to change the condition. And they also expect that there won't be any additional pressure after the elections. And if there are some, you know, if, if uh, the most they could expect is like some political statement, uh, and you can clearly see after a week of elections now, there is no, not even any strong um, like political statement, let alone any kind of actions against it. Though, so I think for 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 me it is like very very calculated attempt in a way that the NLD knows what uh, would happen, and um, and they understand um, the the the, uh, the mentality and the strategy are are the policies from most countries, powerful countries, and they are okay with it. And, and I think that is very, 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 again, uh, damaging for the long-term democratic transitions in the country uh, because a sort of, a, it's sort of like seeding uh, the really dangerous seat in the country's uh, future by setting this norm, by normalizing these discriminations and by trying to uh, you know, completely erase this community from, from the country you know, politically and all other aspects. And which is really harmful, instead of moving forward, we are actually you know, back, backwarding in a, in, in, a, in, a man, in a very dangerous manner. And that is what the current government has not, hasn't actually realized, but far, uh, rather they are really focusing on, um, on their kind of like a, uh, the policies against the Rohingya community, which is based on their hate and prejudice. So going back to uh, you know relationship between the military and NLD, in our observations, I I think uh, you know the military and NLD has similar uh, kind of positions and policies when it's come to the Rohingya and other ethnic minorities. Uh, but they may disagree of, uh, in, when it's come to the power sharing. Uh, they may have confrontations on you know, who got the seat, but in, in, when it's come to the uh, treatment and policies towards uh, ethnic minorities and religious minorities, uh, especially when it's come to the Rohingya, they have a similar stance and positions and, and, and perspective. And their policies has been the same. And uh, that is one thing that we, we need to take very seriously. Um, and again, you know, the, uh, as I said, uh, it also shows that uh, the NLD party has no political will to really change, substantially change this cri or end the crisis in Rakhine state or restore rights of the Rohingya populations. Because I said they don't have political will. Because if they were um, try to uh, this uh, re-enfranchise the Rohingya, enfranchise the Rohingya, they, they, or you know allow Rohingya to vote or the candidate to run, it was not really a a, a, a kind of a difficult processes 
that they might have to change when it comes to technicality. It, it, because as, um, as you all know, the Rohingya were formal, I mean, they were able to vote previously, right? So there is a voter list already exists and they can just pull out those voter li list and, you know, re-enfranchise the people. Uh, but they did nothing to do that. At the same time, when it's come to the uh, barring the Rohingya candidate from running, um, and they they put this um, discriminatory double standard uh, against the Rohingya candidates in when it's when in the processes of scrutinizations uh, of the candidate. So basically, the Rohingya were required to prove their parents. Uh, and uh, their parents' citizenship. Uh, basically, the, the, the Rohingya candidates were required to show citizenship cuts of their parents. When the citizenship cut processes, the current uh, the citizenship cut has only been started to issue in 1990s. Uh, so for those candidates who were like, let's say uh, above 30, uh, age of 30, then their parents will be like 40, 50, and there is no, it's not impossible that any of the citizens of, of the Burma had this current citizenship cut if they are older than, you know, 25 years or older than, I guess, 30 years old, 30 years, right? So it's uh, unfair, discriminatory, uh, while like, for example, other any other candidates are not required to show this cut and they are perceived as a, as a, uh, both citizens and they're not required to show this card, but the Rohingya are because uh, the way the lens that they put on the Rohingya is that you are not citizens, therefore you're, you are required to, you are not both citizen, therefore you are required uh, to prove your parents' citizenship, uh, unlike any other uh, ethnic group. So it's very racialized. Uh, it's really based on identity, how the way they rec the state recognize um, the ethnic groups. So again, it's equal to the denial of the state recognitions of Rohingya as existent as a group. And, and with that lens, they put this discriminatory uh, and a discriminatory standard. And again, most of these are uh, you know, retroactive uh, applications of the law. For instance, my father was once elected parliamentarian in 1990 election, but now, you know, in the age of like 75, six, he is disqualified to run in the election. So once he was full citizens, but then now, like, you know, at the age of 75, he suddenly become you know, like lesser citizens or non-citizens to be able to run in the elections. And I think um, those those are uh, simply the, the po po policy questions rather than con uh, technicality. If they change the policy, it's easier to change the policy. It, it's just a one di uh, order or direct directive from the government to make changes of all of these technical problems. So it's all about, again, uh, the uh, it shows NLD has not put any effort to change all of these policies so that they uh, remove these uh, technical discriminations. And instead the NLD government solidify these discriminations and normalize or even legalize uh, all of these discriminations. And I think this is um, a very serious issue, as um, Andrea and Tom has been has described, uh, because uh, it's again another step to to the genocidal act. Um, so I will end to here. I want to add one thing. Uh, after the election, uh, we are seeing that you know NLD is so empowered by winning this. Uh, landslide again, and it's um, it's somehow uh, for them it's um, reaffirmations of the political support that they have in the country, and they have been very empowered uh, by the support from the uh, from the people. And uh, over the last, uh, I mean, uh, last week, you know, we have been seeing some of the move from the NLD to basically 
limit this uh, uh, civic space. So, you know, there has been many effort and policy coming up to uh, restrict this civil, uh, civil society organizations, as well as, um, you know, a few days ago, uh, the NLD uh, actually put the censorship, um, asked the uh, tele telephone companies to ban some websites, at least four words, websites, and some keywords uh, from the uh, from their uh, what we call from from their channels or what is internet line, so so that people cannot see on the phone. So there has been various att attempts, and um, and I think the 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 election result gives them so much power to control uh, over the life of the people with the assumption that they will not have many ob uh, objection or they won't have many uh, criticism if they do so because they have majority population support them. So I think um, I think these are very concerning attitude that we're seeing. Uh, we don't know what will happen, you know, in the um, coming um, in, in the near future. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Wei Wei. Next, we'll turn to Matt, please. Thank you so much, uh, James. I'm, I'm grateful to, to join all of you here today. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of, a lot of you, you covered a lot of the main issues already that uh, from our perspective with regard to the election. So I'll just add a few things. Um, at, the, at the top of this uh, call, Special Rapporteur Andrews mentioned some uh, similarities between uh, the US elections and the Myanmar elections. I think one other similarity uh, was the record turnout. Uh, and I think it's noteworthy that there was, despite the situation of COVID in Myanmar, there was a record voter turnout this year. Um, and, and the NLD, of course, the National League for Democracy had a, a, a sweeping victory. So there are quite a lot of people in, in the country who are uh, pleased and happy by the NLD's uh, victory. But I think the record turnout in particular points to um, something noteworthy within the, the, the people of Myanmar and their desire to exercise their right to vote. Um, and, you know, the U.S. The, uh, the Union Election Commission declared the election was free and fair. Uh, there were independent Myanmar and in independent uh, election monitors who also declared the election was free and fair. Of course, it wasn't from our perspective, from a human rights perspective, um, but that is uh, part of the discourse uh, in, the, in the country now. Um, you know, from a human rights perspective, again, just to add to a bit of what Weiwei was just touching on, um, there, there was a crackdown ahead of the elections. We were documenting a crackdown against um, uh, human rights defenders in the country, particularly the uh, ABFSU, the All Burma Federation of Student Unions, uh, longtime human rights defenders, pro-democracy um, activists in ABFSU, from September 11th to around October 14th, there were 15 uh, uh, arrests, 14 of whom were members of ABFSU. Some of them are facing five years in prison simply for uh, exercising their right to peaceful assembly. So, you know, as you can imagine in the weeks before national elections, when those types of human rights violations are taking place, um, it leads to serious questions about uh, the, the nature of uh, fundamental freedoms and democracy in the country. So that was a problem. Um, as a special rapporteur mentioned, there were problems also with um, uh, opposition uh, parties uh, expressing uh, their mess, their political messaging uh, freely. That was a problem. Of course, as everybody's mentioned, the Rohingya uh, disenfranchisement, you know, it's been reported widely that there were approximately 1.4 million people disenfranchised uh, from the elections this year in more than a dozen townships throughout the country, including Rakhine State and other places where there's ongoing fighting. Um, and that figure, I think, importantly, does not actually include the number of Rohingya people who are disenfranchised. And if we include that number, it's much, much higher. There are 600,000 Rohingya still estimated to be still in Rakhine State. Of course, not all of them would be voting age, but a significant number of them would be. There are also a million Rohingya refugees in Bangladesh who were unable to vote. Um, and we argued should have and should be given the right to vote. 
um, there certainly would be a large number of voting age um, civilians, uh, uh, Rohingya, in, in the refugee camps. There are also refugees in Malaysia, uh, a sizable number, um, certainly more than 100,000 uh, there. So uh, the disenfranchisement was a very serious problem for the reasons, uh, in our view, that, that Andrea highlighted as well with regard to um, the way in which mass atrocity crimes can go hand in hand with this type of political disenfranchisement. Um, there was, uh, uh, of course, atrocity crimes taking place during the campaign season, uh, particularly in Rakhine State, in, in the ongoing fighting between the American Army and the and the Tatmadaw, the Myanmar Armed Forces, um, and some of the fighting was taking place, you know, while while people were preparing to vote, while this election was taking place, uh, and I think that's important to note. There was a high level of misinformation on Facebook uh, throughout the campaign season, uh, which perhaps we can talk a little bit more about. Um, moving forward, the we're, we're, we're advocating for those who have been disenfranchised to be given the right to vote, perhaps in a by-election. Um, ideally, that could take place sooner than later. Uh, and we would argue the not only the um, ethnic Rakhine and other ethnic nationalities who have been denied the right to vote this time around should be given the right to vote, but also Rohingya in Rakhine State uh, and also Rohingya in the refugee camps. Um, you know, there it's not unprecedented that a refugee population could be given the right to vote in the country that they fled from. In 2004, uh, Afghan refugees, uh, an estimated 850,000 Afghan refugees were given the right to vote uh, in the presidential election in Afghanistan, uh, and they voted from Pakistan and Iran. So uh, there would be, of course, some logistical hurdles, but um, it's not something that the government of Bangladesh international uh, humanitarian agencies and UN agencies, it's not something that would be insurmountable for them to work with the embassy of Myanmar in Bangladesh to ensure that Rohingya have the right to vote. Polling stations could be established in the camps. There could be a verification process. Um, and uh, of course, there does not appear to be any political will, unfortunately, to do that. But it is very important uh, from our perspective that the international community highlight, explicitly highlight the disenfranchisement of the Rohingya people there was a failure to do so uh, explicitly the, during the la after the last elections. And uh, unfortunately, I think uh, that sent the wrong message to the Myanmar authorities with respect to the rights of Rohingya and with respect to the pressure that they'll receive uh, to uh, promote and protect those rights. And, and so one of our concerns now, um, as, as my colleagues here mentioned, is the risk of future atrocities. Great, thank you very much, Matt. I think I would like to give the opportunity to any of you who, if you would like to respond to anything that your colleagues had mentioned um, initially, or uh, I'd be happy to open up with a with another question. But I first wanted to give you a chance if there was anything you'd like to either elaborate on or uh, or question them on. Let me just uh, say that I agree with with uh, all the panelists uh, in with respect to. Uh, the election and the inherent unfairness uh, to just systematically disenfranchise uh, such a large and significant por portion of the of the population. Um, and I think that Matt is exactly correct. I think that um, by elections, establishing uh, elections in those areas and for those groups that have been disenfranchised uh, now moving forward uh, would be a very positive step, a step in the in the right direction. Uh, in an areas like Rakhine State, uh, when the uh, election commission uh, shut down the elections because of the volatility, um, you know, this is not just a matter of fairness uh, to those who were unable to cast their ballots living in those areas. Um, it is dangerous to shut down uh, elections and democracy in areas that are volatile and in which there's conflict going on because people need to know that they can express themselves, their opposition, their concerns um, through a ballot uh, rather than through a bullet. And once you take away that option, uh, you create a, a very dangerous situation. Um, and, and so it's, it's not only a matter of fairness, but I think it's also in the, in the national security interests of Myanmar uh, to hold uh, those elections for those who were disenfranchised. Um, another element here that I thought was uh, particularly important to mention, and that is the um, the shutting down of websites uh, 
um, that Wei Wei mentioned, and some the, the, the arbitrary nature of, of many of these decisions, in some cases because they were issuing criticisms uh, of the government or the or the, or the Tatmada. But but again, not only is this unfair, it denies citizens the right to have access to the information that they need to make informed decisions uh, in a democracy. But it's also uh, dangerous for those living in ethnic minority states uh, who rely upon uh, news websites for news and information, um, particularly when there's um, a volatility, when there's danger afoot in terms of uh, warfare, but also in terms of COVID-19, um, you need to have access to information. So not only is this unfair and unwarranted, but it's also a danger, a danger uh, and could cause, could cause lives. So one of the things that, that I found quite interesting about um, all of the responses so far in your initial thoughts on this is this uh, a real kind of tension between a certain amount of um, uh, acceptance that certain aspects of the elections uh, came off uh, somewhat well in terms of the way they were managed. But then underneath all of that, we have uh, systematic uh, exclusion and other problems that are also a part of that. Um, and so how to balance uh, a reaction to this seems to me to be a tricky position to put uh, uh, people in. I think if one shifts the perspective over to um, issues of treatment of Rohingya and exclusion and all of that, then it, uh, it's a whole separate discussion there that I think has to take place. And I was I was interested in the way that um, I think all of you step back from the kind of domestic uh, discussions or domestic context of this uh, to a regional or even international uh, perspective and a role that could be played there. Um, and I, so I'd love to hear any thoughts that you would have on what kind of um, either leverage uh, might there be from uh, the external worldwide community uh, to try to affect some kind of change or uh, um, uh, advance things in, in, in Myanmar. And that would be one question to ask. And the other one would be, what do you see as the biggest uh, sort of impediments or uh, the biggest uh, barriers to allowing the international community to have some kind of impact in uh, Myanmar that would affect uh, both the elections, but also the future of the democracy and human rights in, in Myanmar? Thank you. So I think it is, um, it is very clear for us uh, to say that both uh, the democracy is not really, uh, you know, moving forward anywhere. Uh, in, in, I mean, democratization in, in Myanmar, uh, when we look back to 2010 and 2020, we had made little progress or no progress apart from having uh, the Aung San Suu Kyi's party as a government. Um, but when it's come to rights and freedom, we have made no progress. Uh, instead, we have actually tightened or restricted our, our even in many, in, in, uh, for the case of Rohingya, we have caused this gross international human rights uh, uh, violations and which um, resulted millions or over a million of people uh, in, to uh, in a very serious uh, conditions and and you know leaving them uh, at the world largest refugee camps. So that's that's the progress that we made out of this uh, flawed democracy that the world has invested. So uh, so uh, with that, I think we are also quite clear that both the Aung San Suu Kyi government and the military will not necessarily promote the democratic principles and, uh, and values. Instead, they are more keen to, to solidify their powers rather than promoting or um, making progress in terms on the human rights and democratic values. So therefore, it is essential for the world to assist at least to protect the people from mass atrocities and the violations of international human rights crimes. So that is why I think the world still has leverage to put uh, the, to assist and to put pressure uh, in the Myanmar uh, democratization processes and in the election itself. And, um, and I, I completely agree with Met on the on met on the on the uh, by election, 
Um, and we also see that some of the media outlet and some embassy statement, they talk about disenfranchisement of the ethnic communities. The numbers that they put up, 1.4 million, it does not include Rohingya. And I think it is really, really common uh, for, uh, for like, you know, for media, uh, for the media and, and, and embassies to uh, kind of, uh, uh, how do we say, to endorse these numbers mm -hmm. and with another level of endorsement uh, of the elections, which is, uh, which is uh, exclusionary or apartheid, uh, apartheid in nature. So we have to like break down to those details and the world must assist to the, to more explicitly what could be in the future uh, and, um, you know, calling for the, uh, the date for the election by elections and, you know, calling for the Rohingyas uh, inclusions in the upcoming by elections, not only for the people in Rakhine state, but also for the refugees um, in in Bangladesh, and refugees were watching, you know, these elections, and and they felt further uh, disenfranchised and and excluded from the state. It's a sort of adding uh, the trauma to the already uh, to the suffering. Um, you know, they are. We have to remember these people are victims of genocide, and you are by by like you know do by with this kind of state behavior. It's added uh, the pain to their trauma, and I think which is very, very uh, uh, important for the state to acknowledge the the, the victims' uh, suffering and their pain, and to help them to repair and by 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 basically helping them restore their rights and justice. Any other comments on that? Yeah, just let me say briefly. I think that that engagement by the international community is so critically important. Um, now more than now more than ever, but I think it's important the type of international engagement uh, with with Myanmar. Myanmar needs friends, and when I say that, I mean true friends. And 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 by true friends, I mean not just those who are looking to uh, get something out of Myanmar, not just to promote their own narrow uh, self interests, um, but those who are true friends that build a friendship based upon uh, principles and values. Uh, that needs to that need to be affirmed, um, and and those values and principles like human rights and democracy are, are in the long term interests uh, of of all the people of uh, of, of Myanmar, and 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 the, the friends that stand up for those principles that articulate those those principles and promote and advance those principles and can be can and and can as friends uh, call the question when those principles and values are being compromised. Those are the kind of friends that Myanmar uh, needs, uh, and that's the kind of international engagement uh, that I hope that we'll see forthcoming. Yeah, I, I think it's an it's an important. I agree with with everything that's been been said there on that uh, with regard to the relevance of the international community. I just want to mention there there were some really significant missteps from the international community ahead of the elections. Um, you know, the uh, several governments essentially finance the elections. Uh, and um, I know there were tens of millions of dollars uh, that came from the US government to the Union Election Commission in Myanmar, as well as other governments that provided support. And what we were calling for before the elections uh, and before that money was handed over was to, um, was, was to um, make certain demands uh, of, of the way in which the election would unfold and, and make the financing, make the funding contingent on the government satisfying those demands. And one of those demands was of course, to enfranchise the Rohingya uh, uh, community to um, cease cracking down on people for exercising their rights to freedom of expression and peaceful assembly. And I think the international community made a mistake. I think uh, the Trump administration made a mistake in the way in which they uh, um, moved forward in, in funding the elections the way that they did. Uh, I think it could have been done in a, in a more careful way and in, in a more friendly way uh, to the special rapporteur's point. Um, and, uh, and so that was a concern and a misstep. And it's the same, it's the same type of problem that we saw in the last elections in Myanmar in 2015. Um, another point, uh, I think, with regard to international misstep, misstep so to speak, um, you know, there, there was an app uh, that was intended to, uh, that was developed by the um, 
well, it was it was funded at least by uh, the EU, by uh, the organization International Idea, uh, which is which is uh, exists to promote democracy, and also the Asia Foundation. And and um, and this app was problematic in that it was referring to uh, Rohingya as Bengali. Uh, which, of course, in, in, in the context of Myanmar is, is pejorative in that it implies Rohingya are from Bangladesh as opposed to being an ethnic nationality indigenous to Rakhine State in Myanmar. So uh, uh, this, um, uh, this was uh, a bit of a fiasco. And uh, the response, the immediate response from those who were uh, behind the app was, was disappointing. Um, there was some defensiveness uh, rather than, you know, simply uh, addressing the problem head on and dealing with it. Everybody makes mistakes. Um, in our view, this was a big one that, that could have been avoided uh, with some due diligence prior to the creation of the app, but it happened. And in light of that, um, you know, those involved really should have taken a head on approach to deal with it. And we didn't really see that, unfortunately. So moving forward, uh, you know, I think the international community does have an important role to play particularly with regard to mass atrocity crimes. Um, you know, the wheels of international justice are spinning right now. Um, and it's slow, generally speaking, but, um, but in, in the context, in, in sort of the, the, um, the, the typically slow fashion that interna international justice proceeds, uh, it's moving relatively fast in Myanmar. Uh, you know, we've seen several mechanisms, um, which, you know, happy to speak more about, but um, but that process is very important. And I think the disenfranchisement of the Rohingya population will certainly factor into the thinking of prosecutors and others who are seeking justice. And I would just add briefly, if I may, that I think you know, when genocide happens as it has against the Rohingya, for example, or when there are other um, episodes of mass atrocity, we often look back and say, where were the missteps and when could a different approach have been taken? Um, so I completely agree with Matt that there have been um, some serious uh, missteps, uh, failed opportunities around the elections. I think when we look back to pre-2017, we look at the international community's reaction to the 2015 elections, that was pretty telling too. I mean, you saw, at least from the US government, um, uh, you know, a, a lifting of, of sanctions and kind of a signal um, ascending that the, the approach of, of the NLD and the, the approach um, that the, the people in, uh, in, in Myanmar had was, was something that the U.S. was supporting. And I think that was a misstep. It could have been a time to really, again, focus on the protection of vulnerable communities. And my fear is that years from now, we might look back and say, well, look at the aftermath of the 2020 elections. That was a key moment when the world could have come together to stress the unacceptable nature of the, the disenfranchisement of the Rohingya, of the ongoing conflict, ongoing mass atrocities against ethnic communities across the country. What a missed opportunity. My, my fear is that we'll be there in a few years. So I think we're at a really critical moment right now. In a growing narrative of uh, dismissing uh, Rohingya um, disenfranchisement or even censoring to talk about it, uh, based on this um, perspective that the NLD is angel party to save uh, the Burma's democracy and future. Therefore, we shouldn't talk this issue and this would um, you know, harm the processes. Uh, it's, it's this narrative has been growing domestically within you know, the democratic uh, like uh, environment or the civil society organizations or uh, the, even the, among some of the human rights groups as well as internationally. And, um, and that is uh, kind of, uh, it has been a little getting serious over the last, uh, before the prior to the pre-elections and post-elections. Um, and, um, and I think, you know, it, it somehow gives a signal to normalize this uh, disenfranchisement. So it seems to me, I mean, you have on the one hand, uh, well, most everybody has been speaking about the international community in the singular as if there's a kind of uh, entity called the international community that also isn't uh, 
um, fractured in its own uh, ways of thinking about what should be done in Myanmar. And, um, and I imagine that, you know, for every dollar that's going in in terms of support for the types of things that Matt was hoping, uh, was discussing in terms of, uh, of structuring the election in a fair and in and, and equal way, um, there's probably also uh, equal and opposite amounts of uh, dollars coming in uh, that are uh, that are impeding that as well too. So, um, I mean, from the from my perspective of somebody who doesn't uh, work in Myanmar or directly with Myanmar too, um, it's quite striking to see how I think the Rohingya issue has a- attracted the headlines of newspapers occasionally, and as a tra- I think as a dren- generally understood uh, problem among, I think, uh, an average kind of population of that's paying attention to international politics, given that we've now, international politics has sort of disappeared off the pages of newspapers, at least here in the US, unfortunately. But still, I think people will recognize if they, if they hear that term, they'll know what it uh, is associated with. I'm just really troubled by the fact that it seems to have a difficult time gaining traction or as a real pressing issue in in the international community and i don't know if this i one you know it could be complexity of the situation uh, in myanmar and and the history that people don't quite understand but um but it is striking to me just uh, that the news is out there and the evidence seems to be uh, quite pronounced and and available and why hasn't it sort of taken root as a as a key issue um on par with other forms of genocide that have taken place around the world and um and this i think you're Andrea's point about this election sort of being a moment to shine a light and and perhaps attract more attention um, was hoping and and thought it might do that. But I I just don't know. We're, you know, we're a bit 10 days removed from that now. uh, And, you know, it still it doesn't seem as if the uh, the attention uh, has been uh, garnered that it possibly could. So I, I don't know if there's anything to speculate or think about in terms of those comments in a more general way, just about um, the the sort of problems of getting this to be a, a, a topic of concern uh, more generally in the international community as well. Yeah, I, I think it's a great point, James. Um, you know, a few, a few thoughts on that. We still uh, are routinely engaged in conversations with um, very well-intentioned uh, people and organizations who still fail to acknowledge that uh, the situation that the Rohingya are facing is genocide. Uh, and you know, from our perspective, if, if we ever hope to live in a world free from genocide, we have to be able to diagnose it when it's happening. And we uh, collected you know, a, a great amount of evidence as did a number of other organizations, as did the UN fact-finding mission and still to this day, the UN fact-finding mission report, and this is, of course, was a fact-finding mission established by the UN, by a resolution at the UN Human Rights Council to investigate atrocities, not only in Rakhine, but also in uh, um, Kachin and Shan states. And the fact-finding mission report, we still see um, uh, it referred to as not having made a genocide determination with regard to the Rohingya situation, which actually isn't true. Their initial large 444 page report um, is fairly explicit and in um, providing evidence of sort of the um, the three elements of of genocide that Rohingya are a protected group that acts of genocide prohibited acts of genocide were perpetrated. And then third, with the intent to destroy in whole or in part, Uh, the report's very clear about that. What the fact finding mission said was now it's time for an international uh, an appropriate um, um, uh, judicial body to ascertain uh, the guilt or innocence of individuals who may be responsible for those crimes. It didn't say that genocide wasn't happening. And so, you know, these types of, um, this, this type of, um, of um, uh, sort of language warfare uh, that happens, I think is, is a problem, um, not only from governments, but also from organizations. And so we would like to see more, uh, I think a, 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 a more robust, acknowledgement of um, the fact that uh, the Rohingya are facing genocide and crimes against humanity. Uh, that's something that the Biden administration, uh, the incoming Biden administration could could correct course on. Um, the Trump administration has failed to make a genocide determination. And this is something we know that people within the, Bi- the, the uh, that are affiliated with uh, President-elect Biden are very committed on, on Rohingya rights. We know that they're committed on human rights in Myanmar. And so we would really hope to see that. 
Um, on the point of um, your point on um, uh, the, the amount of ten attention this is getting, I think it's quite interesting because from the perspective of some groups in Myanmar, they're quite frustrated that uh, in their view, the Rohingya dominate the headlines and the, the, the situation of genocide dominates the headlines and the violations they're facing aren't receiving attention. But from another perspective, a wider international perspective, there's not enough, there are not enough headlines about these atrocity crimes, not only against the Rohingya, but against others. And there are other groups, you know, like for example, the Kachin and the Shan, uh, the, the ongoing armed conflict in those areas is severe. There are abuses that we believe amount to war crimes taking place there. Uh, and, and so, um, you know, I think there are always, always these divergent perspectives. Um, like for example, also, uh, you know, with regard to State Councilor Su Chi, um, you know, she's uh, within Myanmar, she uh, is the subject of uh, attacks for um, defending Rohingya. And then internationally, of course, which of course are unfounded, uh, she's part of the problem in a very significant way. But internationally, um, she's criticized for not defending the Rohingya. So we, we often see these divergent viewpoints coming forward. And I might just add briefly on the genocide point and completely agree with Matt on the need to call crimes what they are. Um, I think uh, I think it's a, a misconception sometimes that people have that genocide is a singular event that has a clear beginning and a clear end, and oftentimes it is this process. And so I wonder, to your original question, um, perhaps people think that the genocide of the Rohingya is something in the past. It has happened, and it's over. Um, and I think it's really important to focus on the risk of the reoccurrence of genocide and the ongoing genocidal risk that the community faces, the ongoing atrocity risks faced by, as Matt said, the, the Kachin, the Shan, the Rakhine, people who are um, continue to, to face uh, serious violent threats by the military. And so I think that, you know, it's it's not a, a violent episode that is over, but rather an ongoing process that that really needs to be addressed today. I, and if, if it's okay, I'd love to return to one other um, question, or not really a question, but a topic that came up in a few um, of your responses, which was, uh, so on the one hand, we have the role of, of uh, domestic and international media in Myanmar, and then we also have the diffused role of, of social media and other platforms and the censorship of those platforms. Um, so looking ahead, I mean, is there, are there ways that uh, some of those tools uh, are being used in creative ways in order to uh, circumvent some of the uh, censorship issues or um, even the uh, uh, control of those platforms. I, know, I was thinking back to the, um, the Hong Kong protests, for example, and, and the very creative ways in which uh, the protesters there started to use kind of uh, coded vocabularies for things or even uh, very creative usage uh, that helped to work around some of the, um, the ways of, of trying to control those platforms. And I was curious if any, of, if, if you knew, I mean, this is one of the the, um, the ways it seems to me that at least disenfranchised groups, if you if you have no pre presence in a, a sort of accepted uh, media venues and things, that this might be a tool for uh, uh, that could be useful. Well, it, it is a social media is extremely powerful, as we all as we all know. And the more we know about uh, the role that social media plays uh, in, a, in in wherever you happen to live. Uh, the more we realize just how powerful it can be for good or for or for ill. Uh, certainly in the United States, uh, you know, there's entire uh, websites that have that have um, uh, daily daily send this narrative uh, that the U.S. elections were were totally uh, stolen, they were fraudulent, and make uh, baseless claims uh, that they uh, and it's very slickly presented. It looks like it's it, it's it's factual when in fact it is complete fiction. That you know that's extremely dangerous. Uh, because social media can uh, focus on an audience, uh, narrower and narrower audiences, and that becomes their world. That becomes the world in which people receive information and and and, and develop opinions. And if it's based upon these these clear fictions, um, developed and advanced for 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 not good ends, uh, then it becomes very very uh, dangerous indeed. Um, and so. Uh, the, the governments can play it, it, very important roles, and I think that the, the the ways in which governments can and should engage by establishing standards and and enforcing basic principles that have been compromised, um, we need to discover those as we move forward and and identify ways the full 
the panoply of ways that governments can protect um, those of us in the public um, to, to be able to get information that we need uh, and not be manipulated in ways that these websites can uh, can manipulate. At the same time, those who are responsible for these platforms, and of course, Facebook um, it comes to mind. Facebook is ubiquitous in uh, in Myanmar uh, and is extremely powerful. And I've had various conversations with with Facebook officials. They they recognize the failings that they had in 2015 uh, in Myanmar that 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 led to to um, very unfortunate uh, circumstances and developments. Um, in, in, to say the least, um, and they uh, pledged to me and said that we're doing, uh, we're investing funds, staff, uh, we're, we're, we're taking pains to um, not duplicate those failings of 2015 and the 2020 uh, 20 election. Uh, well, the jury is out, um, and, and we need to examine very closely uh, what exactly uh, they did, what exactly the impact was, and what are the lessons m moving forward, not only for Facebook, but other um, uh, companies that, that 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 own and control these uh, uh, these 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 platforms. So it's it's an extremely important area uh, that we need uh, to really dig dig more and more into because the power of these platforms are expanding uh, exponentially. Yeah, I mean, um, uh, first of all, I would like to say that the government has been using this telecommunications law to suppress the critical, critical voices on the social media, growingly, and it's very concerning. Um, however, uh, we also uh, have to acknowledge that the role and the, the, the role of social media and the, the, how it is powerful in the, this whole processes, it gives power to the people, uh, especially to minority populations. Uh, and the Rohingya, like, you know, we wouldn't have any idea what is happening if there, is, if there was no social media from the first place in 2012 and up to now. So it's, um, it's really important tool for the victim communities to really, uh, you know, inform the world what is happening from their citizens uh, reporting to, you know, just, um, you know, com communicating and contacting to the people and it was very, uh, very, very, I mean, we must, uh, we are thankful to the, all of these tools that are available as, um, as it, it, it kind of connect with the people and the world. And otherwise, you know, the media in general, media industry in general is uh, in Myanmar is controlled by the state and uh, the private media are highly, prejudice and racist against Rohingya. So, uh, you know, we couldn't ex expect any form of coverage uh, uh, on the uh, crimes and atrocities that has happened or uh, continue to happen in Rakhine. So that that is why I think we have to acknowledge the importance and the prominent role that they play. Um, on the other hand, we are seeing a trend uh, before, uh, I think, until 2017 uh, or before 2015, uh, there was a crowd. Uh, it was the, the, the social media is divided into two groups that the military, pro-military or military um, uh, kind of organized proxy uh, group and accounts. There is a like, you know, uh, a bunch of those guys against the, the, to promote anti-Rohingya and anti-Muslim sentiments and to do all of these campaigns and against any other uh, like, you know, people or accounts or users working on the Rohingya issues. Uh, so th th that is, that's how it's divided. Right now, there is another uh, like really, uh, you know, huge crowd, which is actually pro NLD and pro the Aung San Suu Kyi. So since the presence of the Aung San Suu Kyi before the ICJ, um, the attitude on the social media among the users has changed, has shifted. So she kind of draw attention um, 
uh, of this crowd, like, you know, normal citizens, uh, to herself and the way she portray herself as protecting the state, not necessarily the military, but the state from this outside threat and from this, uh, you know, the, the uh, crimes, or, or I mean, from this trial or outsiders suing against the state. Therefore, we need to unite and we need to uh, protect ourselves. So that's how she somehow gives signal to the crowd, to the normal citizens and citizens and the user, you know, on social media kind of buy that narrative since then all the normal citizens and normal citizens users has turned uh, their uh, attitude like their attack against the uh, human rights activists, uh, uh, you know, pro Rohingya activists, in, you know, activists and users uh, who, ha who are, uh, it, who shows their sympathies and support uh, to the Rohingya. And they have been deeply marginalized and sidelined, bullied and harassed in many ways uh, on the social media. So now is the crowd is normal pro NLD supporters and then those who are working on the human rights with principles. So I think this is so, it has been like, it's deeply polarized than ever before and it is extremely concerning. I would just add on the on the uh, on the point about social media on the issue of social media in in, in the context of Myanmar, um, you know, Facebook uh, um, is ubiquitous in Myanmar, as the special rapporteur mentioned, and the, um, the company has devoted. Uh, our understanding is the company has devoted quite a lot of resources to trying to right the wrongs to to do better. Uh, you know, they've hired uh, excellent, smart people, people knowledgeable of human rights, knowledgeable of, of some of these issues. Um, however, the platform uh, is still being used to spread misinformation in Myanmar. But beyond that, uh, you know, the Gambia, which, of course, is bringing a case at the International Court of Justice in The Hague against Myanmar for genocide, attempting to uh, hold the state, as Wei Wei Nu mentioned, hold the state accountable for uh, the crime of genocide. Um, the, the Gambia has filed an application in U.S. federal court seeking information from Facebook that could be used to help hold uh, uh, the state of Myanmar accountable for genocide. And Facebook is fighting it tooth and nail, and they're refusing to cooperate. Um, and, and initially, actually, a spokesperson from the company um, falsely claimed uh, to uh, Reuters news agency that the company was cooperating with the uh, the IIIM, the, the body established uh, by the Human Rights Council to collect and preserve evidence of genocide. Uh, and of course, that was untrue. It was exposed that the company had, was not actually cooperating. And then they've since, our understanding is they've since started to cooperate with the IIIM. But this case, this application in US federal court is still pending. And there are some recent indications uh, that the court will decide in favor of the Gambia, which I think would be a good thing. Um, and, you know, in conversations and in, in taking a look at what Facebook's um, argument is to the court and having had conversations with Facebook executives, you know, what the company is essentially claiming is that, well, you know, they're trying to hide firstly behind the Stored Communications Act. And the Stored Communications Act is really important, but it was never meant to protect perpetrators of genocide. And the company is essentially claiming one of their arguments is that if they provide evidence in this particular instance to the Gambia via U.S. federal court, then they won't be able to uh, they won't be able to um, uh, reject applications from other from say you know some repressive government that wants information about human rights defenders and 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 this is this is. Uh, um, Kind of a ridiculous argument uh, because it would set it wouldn't set any precedent uh, in law. It would simply set an internal precedent, and Facebook is free to violate any of its internal precedents. If a if a if a uh, a rights violating regime asks Facebook for information that it shouldn't have or information that it will misuse to violate human rights, uh, the company is of course would would still be able to cooperate with the Gambia and not provide information to another repressive government. So we have not been terribly impressed with uh, Facebook's commitment to human rights with regard to the Rohingya situation, unfortunately.
So thanks. Uh, so one final question um, is that given uh, the um, coverage of the 2020 Myanmar elections in the, at least in the international media, um, I was wondering if, if each of you could perhaps uh, choose one element or one important story that you don't think has garnered the attention of the international media that you think should be, uh, have some kind of, uh, of coverage or mention at least. Well, well, James, I think that um, the international community is just paying too little attention uh, to me and mine in general, and, and certainly to these elections. And that the top lines that uh, get churned out by many of the media outlets is that, well, they had this election, there, were, there was no violence, uh, and many are claiming that this election was free and fair. Um, that's unfortunate. Uh, these, this was not a free and fair election uh, to millions of people who were disenfranchised in that, in that country. Um, and so I think that's extremely important for uh, all of us uh, who have any kind of a role in advancing the narrative uh, of what happened in these elections, good, bad, or otherwise, that that point be made. But I also think it's important in a broader perspective to realize that this is not truly a democracy and that the elections that were taking place um, were for not for seats in parliament, they were for um, 75% of the seats in the parliament, because 25% of the seats in parliament um, are not elected whatsoever. They're appointed by the military uh, that is, has complete control of, uh, of, of, of three of, of the most significant of, of, or among the most significant branches uh, of government and have enormous economic power. In other words, there's no check and balance on uh, the, the, the military. So when you talk about an election, you need to put it in the framework of how many disenfranchised people there are, but also uh, that this is not truly a democracy when you have a military power having so much power, veto power, if you will, over anything that an elected body would uh, would have. That's extremely important to, for us to keep reminding people. Thank you very much. That, that helps clarify because uh, I think it is a complicated um, situation of for most observers from the outside who aren't specialists of Myanmar to, to understand how that relationship works actually in the ongoing uh, uh, power of the of the military in the government. So. Yeah, yeah. I would I would just add to that that uh, you know there 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 is this notion that the elections are finished, and they're not. Uh, there are quite a number of people still waiting to vote, and we would fully encourage the international community to speak with one voice on the need to enfranchise those who have been disenfranchised from these recent elections to hold by elections in which not only Rohingya in Myanmar and not only ethnic Rakhine or Arakanese. Uh, as well as others, Kachin and Sean and others who were unable to vote, they should have the opportunity to vote. But uh, Rohingya refugees in, in Bangladesh and perhaps in Malaysia as well uh, should also um, be given the opportunity to vote in these elections. And I think that's something that um, we'll certainly be pushing for. It's amazing how uh, we already heard earlier on just about how uh, uncanny some of the connections between the U.S. elections and the Myanmar election are and the fact that we have to be fighting for the right to be able to vote, even in, a, in, a, in our democracy, too, and, and the ability to then count those votes, that, that that's even part of our discussion is, is really quite an astonishing place to be in 2020. Um, yes, Weiwei? Uh, yes, um... I think the first thing is that uh, now uh, media start, uh, needs to ask the, um, the, the, the date around by election, as well as emphasize on, as uh, Matt was saying, the enfranchisement of Rohingya uh, in Rakhine, as well as in Bangladesh, and perhaps in Malaysia as well. Um, that's one thing. And secondly, I have not seen a, a lot of coverage, much coverage around the uh, voices of, um, you know, ethnic parties or the Rohingya parties, political parties, in among the in the in the uh, international media before the elections and after the elections. And I think, um, uh, I mean, that is one area that we we need to focus the. It, that both international media and international community should listen the ethnic political parties, including Rohingya political parties. Uh, they have been somehow left uh, ignored uh, for so long, and I think which is very, a very um, uh, like it is not helpful at all. Um, and lastly, you know, based on the election result, we can see you know NLD is uh, actually. Uh, you know, predominantly Burmese uh, Buddhist 
party. It doesn't necessarily represent or reflect the uh, ethnic communities uh, and their desire and their political visions. So somehow over the past uh, several years um, during the military dictatorship or after the political transition, the Burmese dominated regimes, whether the military government or, you know, this uh, quasi-civilian governments uh, after 20, uh, 2011, there has been a sort of, you know, many ethnic communities understand this, what I am saying. Uh, there was a process of, you know, changing demography in ethnic areas. Uh, basically, when it's come to the Rohingya area or Rakhine area, uh, you know, in Rakhine state, uh, there were like several projects that uh, bring the ethnic uh, Burmese and Burman uh, from mainland area to the ethnic area. Like, for example, in Rakhine state, you know, there were like more than 150 villages, new villages that has built. Uh, and bring like Buddhist Burmese populations from the, uh, you know, Burmese uh, uh, state or region to the ethnic, like to the Rakhine state. And it's the same models applies in other ethnic areas. And also uh, because of this uneven distributions of wealth and economy, the, the Buddhist Burman, some in the poor region, have uh, have been moving to the rest of the ethnic area. So there has been, in many many ways, uh, demography shift shift in the ethnic area, and um, and that reflect the result of the election this year. So basically, in many ethnic areas, NLD won, and this is very um, kind of. Uh, the, the tragic reality for many ethnic communities that their voices, their representations are losing, reducing because of the result of long term, uh, the, the, the processes of changing democracy of the, uh, demography of the ethnic populations, which is also again uh, linked to these, uh, you know, the discussions around federalism and power sharing within the commune, within a, between the Burmese uh, group and then the ethnic minorities. So I think when we look at the country's uh, political change in a broader perspective, the, the world need to pay attention to some of those details, uh, some of those changes and need to listen to the ethnic communities and give them voices because otherwise we will be somehow uh, you know, contributing to this Burmanization uh, processes that many of us uh, have believed in and ha happening over the past uh, uh, several years. Burmanizations, and now we, the behavior of this, uh, you know, the, the, the people, normal civilian and in the country who support the National League for Democracy uh, is somehow become more and more aggressive it's it's feel like it, it is leading to the majoritarianism rather than democracy so this is i think that's the last thing i want to say wonderful thank you i mean it, i think it's it's very clear to me that um you know one can always put a lot of hope in elections as being a major watershed for change or um uh, at least a dream of of, of righting all the wrongs and, and 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 having a clean restart on things but that's clearly not what happens it's clearly not what we're seeing here clearly what's not happening in myanmar as well and it and what i've learned from from all of you very clearly today is that um as myanmar uh, progresses now out of the elections into uh tackling some of those hard problems um that there are a lot of uh, very very fine-grained issues that um, are challenging and difficult topics to resolve. And if there's any role that the Asia Center can play to convene, you know, discussions uh, between uh, you all uh, and any voices uh, in Myanmar itself, uh, that um, I would love to have a platform or a forum to be able to really uh, get into some of those in a more specialized way. I think this would be uh, a very nice th thinking of today as kind of an opening up of a much larger discussion that really takes diligence and, and attention over time to really uh, bring about some of these changes before the next uh, round of elections. Um, but clearly these are 
systemic types of problems that are not unique to Myanmar, but they have their own uh, very distinct characteristics there that have to be uh, tackled. So I'm hoping we can invite you back at some point to, uh, to engage in, in further discussions. But I, I just want to end by thanking you all very much for taking the time and uh, expressing so clearly and cogently um, the issues that uh, were part of this uh, 2020 uh, uh, set of Myanmar elections. Um, and thank you all very much. Thank you, James. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. Thanks so You're much, welcome. James. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm.